So lasers. I used to work at this laser company and uh, uh, people used to call the company all the time and so the, the secretary would kind of route them around one at a time so you, you all got a chance to deal with this, you know, and they would call up and say, I'm an inventor and do you make lasers and, you know, then some wacky idea. The one I loved the best was, and, and this proved me wrong, the one I loved the best was this guy called me up and, and they, were, they were raising these little, little baby salmon and they were going to send them out to the ocean, but they wanted to brand the salmon, and so that when the salmon came back, they'd know it was from their salmon ranch. And so he wanted, <laughs> he wanted to nail these salmon with this carbon dioxide laser. And I said, uh, well, you'll know they're yours. They'll be floating at the top. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it turns out, they actually brand salmon with a little YAG laser. You know, you know when you buy a bottle of beer, it's got those marks on the side with the dates? That's, that's a pulsed laser that does that. They actually do that on little baby salmon, and it works apparently, so I was wrong. <laughs> so it was an interesting place to work because of all that stuff that like, came through the door. Okay, I want to talk about the basic components of a laser, and then I want to talk about common lasers. How do they work? So we're going to talk about flash lamp, Q-switch, YAG lasers, diode pump, solid state lasers, dye, short pulse, and then quantum cascade diode lasers. We just kind of go through a little bit of sort of a sampler of lasers and how do they work. Laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Did, any, did you all know that already? It was invented after the maser, which was microwave, we're going to start by looking at the classical layout, uh, Fabry-Perot stable resonator, continuous wave laser, and then we'll go on to other things. So we'll talk a little bit about what's going on inside this thing first. So lasers are optical oscillators, so if you think of an electrical engineer, that means you need gain and feedback. So how do we get feedback? So there's going to be a gain medium inside this thing, but for now let's just talk about feedback. It's a Fabry-Perot resonator. I've been talking about these things for a while. A couple of mirrors pointed at each other. There's a thing called, whoops, a thing called a high reflector, okay, because it has the highest reflectivity you can manage to coat. Uh, these coatings on the lasers are dielectric coatings that are laid down in, a, in an evaporator system, sort of like a CVD uh, system. The thing is going to be spaced apart by L, and then there'll be an output coupler, which yeah, the, the amount of uh, transmission you put on the output coupler depends on what the gain level is inside the cavity and what else you're doing. So you choose some sort of uh, uh, output coupling that optimizes the performance of the laser. Um, and so the laser beam comes out in this direction. So this is a picture of a Fabry Perot. We keep talking about them. Uh, it's really just a couple of pieces of glass with high reflector coatings on the inside, okay? And it goes as I just drew on the board in the earlier lecture, uh, the spacing at a, particular, at a particular light wavelength will sustain a standing mode inside it, and if you happen to feed it with light at exactly that same wavelength, it will build up that mode inside the cavity, and actually you get a huge amount of buildup inside the Fabry-Perot cavity, and, and the light comes out. If you're not spaced exactly right to match those uh, boundary conditions, it won't feed light in, it'll just be re reflected straight back. So that's what a, an electrical engineer would, be, would call a resonant tank. So this is the, the bandpass behavior of a Fabry-Perot etalon. So this is transmission through the etalon as a function of frequency. Go, and this thing actually continues out to infinity in that direction and infinity in that direction, okay? So when we hit the point where we've actually matched the resonance of the cavity, the thing has throughput which is what these peaks are. And when we don't match that resonance, there's no throughput, the light's reflected back in the other direction, okay? Uh, so this is for high reflectivity, the red one is, and the uh, blue one is for low reflectivity. So we were talking a little bit earlier about using a Fabry-Perot as a filter. How do, you, how do you use it as a filter? Well, um, the way to get a really uh, high quality Fabry-Perot, this, this issue here of how, how narrow, the, okay, the width, the full width of half maximum of this uh, transmission peak compared to the distance to the next one, so the ratio of those two is called the finesse of the cavity. So if you want really high finesse, you need really high reflectivity mirrors. Uh, 
And so what they do nowadays is they, uh, they make a substrate by polishing it, say a flat substrate. They don't have to be flat, but flat is the most common for this kind of spectral filtering we were talking about. They polish it, and then they go through a system where they, they use an electron beam to like take down the, the little peaks and troughs that were left by polishing. They make this thing extremely flat, and then they coat dielectrics on it. Because you see, any kind of a little, any, any scratch or peak or something like that will cause scattering, and that will, get, that will cause a loss inside the, the cavity. So to get really high finesse, really, really narrow bandwidth, they, it costs, it, the, the, more you, the, the better bandwidth you want, the more it costs. But if you're just using it to make measurements of uh, uh, changes in wavelength, like, like in the wavelength modulation spectroscopy exercise, it doesn't need to be that good. But if you're trying to use it for spectroscopy, it needs to be better. The point being that the laser resonator I just showed you looks a little bit like this. It's a couple of mirrors facing each other, right? It is a Fabry Perot cavity. And so actually lasers have the same behavior. They have these modes. These are called longitudinal modes because they're spaced by C, the speed of light, divided by 2 times the length. In other words, round trip over and back. The, those modes will always be spaced by the C over 2L. It's called the C over 2L mode spacing of a, of a Fabry Perot type laser. So the laser, the laser will oscillate. The, the electric field inside the laser will oscillate at these frequencies inside the resonator. Okay, so it turns out there are also lots of stability issues with one of these resonators. These, these are what are called stability plots for laser resonators. Um, and, and there's this, this is going to sound funny, but there's, to, to do like a full-blown electromagnetic calculation on these things can be a little bit time consuming. So there's this thing, there's this thing called the Fox and Lee approach where you just send you assume, you, you, let's say you want to analyze this cavity here. You assume what you think is kind of like the, uh, the beginning uh, right there. And then you, you just send a pancake in that direction computationally, and then you send it back. And if it doesn't come back on itself, you you've change the pancake a little bit and send it over. It turns out that converges fairly quickly. So you can, you can actually uh, um, analyze these stability plots fairly quickly. And so these are different kinds of resonators and where they might fit in the stability diagram. When we were designing, I mean, I used to do this all the time. I used to design these resonators. You never want to be near one of these edges. We would always land like right in there. That resonator I showed you with the flat and the curved, uh, when we would design lasers like that, we'd try to land in here. Because if you're near the edge, any little thing would throw it out of stability and your laser would die and then it would come back. And then, you know, that's just, you don't want that. So nothing ever happened along the edges. It they would always happen inside. So this one's almost hemispherical. You don't want purely hemispherical. It's too unstable. That stability criteria, th they apply for what's called the lowest order spatial mode, uh, it's, which is a Gaussian intensity profile. You remember I, uh, I talked about plane waves, and I showed that picture of these, uh, these planes you know, with, and K was out here, right? There was another plane back here, so on and so forth. Uh, the, the idea of those planes and lasers do emit what look like plane waves, but the point is, those, the plane waves, these conceptual plane waves go out to infinity, but the electric field strength dies away very quickly as you go out and it dies off. So we're not actually violating energy conservation because the amplitude of the, of the electric field or the, or the irradiance, they die off very quickly and go down to zero even though conceptually uh, 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 an electric field can, can be out there. And so that's what, that's, that spatial structure is what's called the spatial mode. And so here are some of the spatial modes that can be sustained inside a laser resonator, and I've seen all of these. This is the one that you want to buy. This is the one people typically sell. It's the, the mode is called TEM00 for transverse electromagnetic, in other words, Transverse. These are transverse waves, right? So transverse electromagnetic structure inside the, uh, the cavity. Um, but you can support all of these spatial modes. They are all, all Hermit Gaussian spatial modes. And uh, I used to work in the, I used to have a laboratory right next to the service uh, department at Spectrophysics, and you'd hear people talking out there. And so uh, the, the colloquial name for that mode at Spectrophysics is baby's butt. You're running baby's butt. 
And they, they didn't have names for these other ones. Now, part of the, you know, I've been talking about all that laser noise. Well, the laser noise can come from mode beating. You, and how do you make modes beat? It's because there's a little bit of shifting between the modes, right? Just a little bit of shifting shifts the phase from one mode to the next. It makes a huge amplitude, especially when you're not, when you have very few modes. Okay, when you have very few modes, just a little bit of shifting around causes a huge, because they're, they're going to add coherently, it just makes a huge amount of amplitude change. So for a laser, you either want it to be single frequency, just one longitudinal mode and one spatial mode, or you want it to be flooded with modes so that it doesn't notice little changes between them. This, this thing in between with, you know, ten modes or something like that is, is a disaster in terms of noise. So this one is the one that you want to use for uh, scientific lasers. It, uh, it has the highest brightness, you know, brightness in terms of uh, uh, per unit area, per unit uh, divergence angle. This one diverges the, the least and is the smallest. It's the brightest mode. It's also the one that's easiest to deal with. There are equations for how do you propagate a Gaussian mode. If you go to Siegmund's laser book, he explains how you get those and how to use them. So that's how we typically sold them. Usually you try to design the optical cavity so that you get one of those. The problem is if you have laser gain outside of that area, one of these other modes might try to oscillate. So you try to contain the gain into just the, the TEM00 mode, and you also try to design the cavity to force the TEM00 mode to match the gain. But often you end up with gain outside of that, and so then you end up having to use an aperture inside the cavity to kill off the other modes, which means you're throwing away gain, which is a shame. So if, you, if you're forced to use an aperture, that means something's not right. So we also have to have laser gain inside the cavity. So now let's put in a gain medium. So, so we have light circulating back and forth inside the cavity. There's a gain medium. And somehow we're going to pump the gain medium. So there are a lot of different uh, pumping processes. The, the quanta rays, you know, the, the pulsed YAGs use lamps. You can use another laser. Dye lasers are pumped by other lasers, right? Diode pumped YAG lasers are pumped by diode lasers and so forth. Or you can draw electrical current through them. That's what uh, the, the plasma tube lasers like argon, ion, or krypton, or so forth, that's what they use. A lot of different ways to produce gain. There are different uh, spectroscopic aspects of lasers. The most common is what's called a four-level system. So we're looking at the spectrum of the laser gain medium. And now the horizontal axis, the width of those lines, is meant to represent relative population. So what else have I got to say here? OK, we like four levels. But anyway, the point is we're going to pump somehow from the ground state up to some upper state. And we, we want to pump quickly up to that state and then have rapid relaxation down to this level here. We want uh, an upper laser level that does not rapidly depopulate. Because what we want to do is be able to store gain up there. And then what we want is for there to be really one preferred mode for this to come back down to the ground state, and that would be by giving off light. So we want that to be a state that, uh, that does not give off uh, its energy easily in other ways, and there are some of those. Now, uh, if we have uh, a laser beam come through, it will stimulate emission, and these will come down to the lower laser level down here. Now, this is called a population inversion because according to Boltzmann statistics, we're supposed to have more of the atoms in the gain medium in the, in the lower level, not in the upper level, right? So we have created an artificial situation where there's actually a lot more population up here than down there. That's what gives us gain. That gives you optical gain. And then the lower laser level is supposed to quickly dump down to the ground state. Now, you don't want the lower laser level to be the ground state, because if it were the ground state, it would absorb these photons. And it would just like, you know, chew up its own uh, light. Uh, it turns out that the very first laser ever uh, demonstrated was a ruby laser. That's uh, <coughs> chromium in sapphire. And ruby is a three-level laser, which means we, it has the ground state, the upper state, this state, and then no lower laser level. And the only way they got that to laze was with a, a flash lamp. So it was a pulsed laser. It's called gain switched. And so what would happen is that we, they were relying on the dynamics of the interaction. So what would happen is 
it would go flash and send a whole lot up here, it would come down here, and then it would come down and, and, it would, and then it would shut itself off. But in the process, it would give out a burst of light. So you don't want uh, a three-level laser like that. You want a, you want a four-level laser. And most, the gain media that we use nowadays is four levels. So the stimulated emission process is coherent. So the photons inside the cavity are, end up taking out more uh, photons. Those photons are in the same direction as the photon that stimulated the transition. So one comes in, it's going in a certain direction, it's got a certain frequency. The, the others are gonna, are gonna be stimulated, to, they're gonna come out in the same direction and they will be coherent with the one that stimulated them. And so what you get circulating inside the cavity are, are photons that uh, are going all together in one direction and they are coherent. <coughs> So within this TEM00 spatial mode that I showed you, the cavity can actually support an infinite number of longitudinal modes. So I showed you all of those spatial modes, right? Each one of those spatial modes can support a, just, well, the cavity can support an infinite number of longitudinal modes to go with each one of those spatial modes. But there is a finite gain bandwidth, as we call it. So this, if you think about it, we've just been talking about spectroscopy and I showed you that we had this energy level system, well, there's a, there's a bandwidth to the spectroscopic transition that we will be using. And it's, it's structured a little bit in a more complicated way than, than uh, like a Voigt profile, but it has a specific bandwidth to it based on the spectroscopy of the system. So what happens is there's a threshold here, it's called. The threshold is set by losses inside the cavity, like the the transmission of the output coupler, scattering, those kind of things, right? You have to get the gain up above that threshold or nothing will ever happen. Once you get above the threshold, the, the laser will oscillate within the gain bandwidth. So you get these longitudinal modes. These are the longitudinal modes of the laser within the gain bandwidth. And outside of the gain bandwidth, nothing happens. So only modes inside the gain bandwidth can oscillate. So the laser oscillates when the gain is above the lasing threshold. So how does this thing start up? When you, when you hit start on a laser, how does it start? Uh, well, you begin pumping the gain medium. And, and if you think about the, the energy levels I showed you, it's a spectroscopic system, right? So it will fluoresce, and it's going to fluoresce in all directions. What that means is we call them noise photons, but there will be photons like on the center line of the laser beam traveling in the correct direction and they will begin to stimulate emission as they travel along. And, and in the laser world, we call that sweeping out the gain. This thing will come barreling down the gain medium and sweep out the gain and, and organize everything in a, in a way that produces a coherent stream of these photons. So that light will fall within the spatial and longitudinal mode structure of the system now. Because if you think about it, it is a Fabry-Perot resonator. If this thing doesn't actually match the Fabry-Perot modes, it will die. So ultimately, this thing has got to match uh, the spatial and, and longitudinal mode structure of the system, but there are enough fluorescent photons in the gain medium to make it go, it looks instant to, to your eye. So the, those modes can build up to very high intensity, but it leaks out uh, of the output coupler. I don't know if you've thought about this before, but the, actually the, the irradiance of the light inside the cavity is much higher than, than what comes out. depending, of course, on the, how much output coupling you're using. So a laser can sit, just to re recap, a gain, there's a gain medium, and we take advantage of a four-level spectroscopic system to make a population inversion. We have feedback by the fabry perot cavity to allow uh, buildup of uh, stimulated emission. Transmission of the output coupler is designed to maximize the output power. And so what that means is the intracavity gain sits right at the threshold because what you want to do is bleed as much out of this thing as you can. You want, you want as much power, I mean, everybody who buys a laser wants lots of power, right? Well, they're trying to make it produce as much power as it can. So high brightness scientific lasers uh, try to stuff as much gain into the fundamental mode, spatial mode as they can. It's hard to do that with a lamp pump system especially much easier with laser pump systems because you can focus the laser beam in places. Industrial lasers, uh, they try to extract as much power as they can get. So like a big industrial carbon dioxide laser that's cutting steel and welding and that kind of stuff, they tend to operate multi-mode. Uh, 
because they get more gain, they can take out more of the gain that way and they don't need to have just the one uh, spatial mode. So what happens sometimes is that, uh, especially if you're buying from a, a company that, uh, well, I don't want to name names. There are some companies that mostly build lasers for industry. And then they, they make a scientific version of that laser. What that is is that's, a, uh, that's like a Clydesdale horse that they're trying to strangle. And, and it, those aren't happy lasers. <laughs> So, if I were you, I'd go to a company that doesn't make, that, that, that has a fairly large market in scientific lasers. Even though this company is trying to sell you a laser for less, you don't want to buy a Clydesdale that's being strangled because it'll stomp all over your laboratory. How do you like that for an analogy? So let's talk about uh, this. We're going to talk about different kinds of lasers. Flash lump, pumped, Q-switch, YAG lasers. When I worked at Spectrophysics, one of the first jobs I did was with Quantaray. So I'll tell you about what's inside a Quantaray YAG laser. These are YAG laser rods. It's neodymium in a glass host. YAG is uh, yttrium aluminum garnet. Uh, there are other hosts. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, neodymium uh, YLF, yttrium lanthanum fluoride. Uh, YULF, uh, it's called YULF in the laser world, uh, actually has uh, a longer fluorescence lifetime, which means you can store more gain uh, in the upper level, right? It's uh, it, the, why don't we always use YULF? It's because, for one thing, YULF can be eroded by water. It's not good if it's water-cooled. And uh, it's softer than YAG. So some lasers use YULF, some don't. Then there's another one called uh, neodymium vanadate, which has also got a very long excited state lifetime. Uh, that used to have uh, real manufacturing problems, but nowadays they seem to be pretty good. So YAG is not the only available host, but uh, yttrium aluminum garnet is a very tough glass, which is nice. So th these are the YAG rods, and they sit inside here, and they are pumped by flash lamps. How many of you have uh, used one of these lasers? Mm -hmm. And have you ever, like, changed the flash lamps on those things? Yeah, some people have. The flash lamps go inside a tube here. So this is a gold-coated reflector cavity, so this lamp goes flash. And, and there's uh, cooling water flowing through these things. It has to be deionized cooling water because there's this big voltage uh, across the lamps, of course. Uh, and, and the cooling water, that's what these fittings are for. The cooling water keep everything cool and doesn't get it too hot. And so the lamp just uniformly blasts the egg rod. And that's where we're getting gain in this particular case. So the upper lasing level of neodymium is long, and so you can store a lot of energy up there. The energy can be stored, actually, only if it's not allowed to oscillate, okay? And so the cavity Q is destroyed using a Q switch. What are they, well, I don't know if you remember from electrical engineering, they, when they talked about an oscillator, they talked about, you know, if it had, if it had a very narrow uh, resp uh, frequency response, you know, that was high Q. Remember that? Electrical oscillator circuit. Well, this is the same thing as a Fabry Perot finesse. So maybe it really should have been a, called a finesse switch or something like that. But anyway, the point is it kills this Fabry Perot behavior. In other words, it shuts off the cavity. And so you're pumping a lot of energy into the ag rod, but the, the laser itself can't oscillate. You're not allowed to have this startup that I was describing. Until this Q-switch decides to open the cavity. So it looks somewhat like this. So here's the laser gain medium. Here's the high reflector. They usually sit at the back of it. There's a polarizer and a pockel cell. A pockel cell, you remember I told you about this optical Kerr effect time gate that we were using where it went by our fringes and we were switching it with an electric field from the laser pulse? This is like that, except that a pockel cell uses electrodes across the crystal to do the same thing. So when the electricity, when the high voltage field is across the crystal, it makes the crystal birefringent. And so it'll switch open and switch off. So it's almost identical to a, to a Kerr gate, except that in this case we use electrodes. With a Kerr gate, it was actually a, a, an optical pulse that did it. So. Uh, when the Q-switch is closed, no light circulates because what we get is rotation of the polarization. So when it gets here, it gets rejected from the cavity. Then when we turn the pockel cell on, suddenly 
it changes the polarization, and now we have vertical polarization going straight through the gain medium. We can get oscillation. So you pump this thing with the lamp. Those of you who've used these things before, you know there's, there's a, a Q switch delay, the, the, and you can adjust that for when is the Q switch going to open compared to the, when the lamps fire, right? What you get really is like a photon explosion, if you want to think in terms of chemistry or something like that. So, so here I'm showing you the output power. That's the pulse that comes out of one of these things. They used to be called giant pulse lasers. I like that name. And this is the single pass gain in the gain medium. So you've got high single pass gain until the Q switch opens, and bam, you get this explosion of photons. And what happens is right up here, the gain has now been swept down below threshold. Okay, the lamps went off. There's no more gain now. This thing stored a lot of gain. Lamps go off. This thing sweeps, uh, sweeps out all the gain, and now the gain has gone below the threshold. And so this is cavity ring down right here. That's why YAG lasers have this exponentially decaying tail. It's the same thing as cavity ring down. So it's just, a, it's just an overlap between those two, a, a very rapidly rising exponential, and then uh, cavity ring down. So the lamps are on for, you know, on the order of 230 microseconds. The Q-switch can open very quickly. Bang, this thing comes out. So when the cavity opens, the fluorescence photons do their thing. They start the oscillation. Uh, an intense pulse builds up. The in then the intracavity energy dies away, and that's it. So why did they make the lasers this way instead of continuous? It's because uh, they were able to extract a whole lot more energy for a short period of time. So that at the peak of the pulse, there's a lot more intensity. That's why. The thing is, the intracavity energy is so high, you can easily drill. You can, it's easy to drill holes in, in YAG with lasers like this accidentally. In fact, if you accidentally retroreflect, I don't know if people still talk about that, but if you accidentally retroreflect some of the one micron light from outside back into the cavity, the, the amplifier, when it, goes, when it suddenly has gain, It'll amplify that retroreflected light, and sometimes it'll like destroy the glass. So uh, in this case, this uses what's called an unstable resonator, which makes about five to ten passes through the cavity. And so the output coupler is actually curved in this direction because what you want is for the you want the beam to grow with distance as it gets more and more intense, so it won't drill the rod. The YAG rod is actually like, this, this stands for gradient index lens, and that's because it's being uniformly heated by the lamp. It's, it's getting hot. The, the thing is the lamp, uh, in terms of spectroscopy, the lamp has a lot of uh, light at wavelengths that are not absorbed by the neodymium. So you're actually pumping a whole lot of energy into this glass rod that's not being absorbed in the, in the, in the four level system. And so it's just heating the rod. So the rod gets uniformly heated, but it's cooled on the outside by the cooling water. So the index uh, has a radial dependence because of that. So it's actually a live lens inside the cavity. So when they, at the factory, when they make one of these things, they choose the curvature of the high reflector uh, to give the desired beam size and divergence out coming out of here because each one of those YAG rods, when you make a YAG laser, is slightly different. So the lensing is slightly different. So when you buy a YAG rod, it has a specifically chosen high reflector for the, uh, when you buy a YAG laser, it has a specifically chosen high reflector for the rod that's in your laser. And, and if you have a rod, if you end up having to have the rod changed, the person who comes has different high reflectors uh, to change them out. Now the point there is that that's the reason why if you have a 10 hertz YAG rod, they say you can change the repetition rate a little bit, but not much. It's because if you change it a lot, you're gonna change the heating, that'll change the beam properties, and you could run into trouble. So the, the, this pseudo-Gaussian spatial mode of the unstable resonator can be fairly complex. Uh, they used to, they used to sell a mode that looked like a donut. The center was empty. That was actually a more fundamental mode for an unstable resonator than that, but everybody hated the donut. Uh, so they went to this thing that looks a little bit different from that. And so actually it's a, it's a kind of an overlap of a lot of different spatial modes uh, producing that. The longitudinal modes can beat, as I've talked about before. So this is a pulse that comes from one of those lasers, and you see this beating in the longitudinal modes as it comes out. And those, uh, somebody in here was talking about that a little while ago. Those, from each, from shot to shot, they do this, 
and there's a whole lot of uh, uh, change from shot to shot, which is a problem. People used to have to do a lot of averaging to get rid of all of that. So you get a fairly broadband pulse with a lot of intensity very well, it's not that broadband. I shouldn't have said it that way. It's, it's moderately narrow band compared to some other, like a tie sapphire laser. No, I'm not even sure why I said that. It's not super narrow band, let's put it that way. <laughs> anyway, it affects everything else that happens downstream. When you pump a dye laser with this thing, and it's going to have more of that happening, and you don't like that. So you do this thing called injection seeding, and then you get a really nice looking pulse. So what you do is you, you have a really small single frequency diode pumped laser. It's called a master oscillator. It's this, it's this very low power little thing, okay? And you send that down the cavity and it goes straight down the center of the cavity, okay? So it's going into the slave it's called, which seems kind of funny to me because this thing they call a giant pulse laser is now the slave to this tiny little oscillator, right? But that's how they call them. So it's easy to operate these low power little master oscillator lasers, just incredibly stable, single frequency, locked on, just really nice lasers because basically they're just a solid chip. So there's not much that can, that can go wrong with that. And they, they, they send it into a big pulse system which is not easy to operate single frequency. You purposely have slave modes that are tuned in frequency uh, to overlap one of the master oscillator longitudinal modes. And, and there are several different ways to do that. The, the way that's the most common is to, they put a, uh, uh, a piezoelectric stack on the output coupler and they can change the cavity length just slightly. Remember I was talking to you about the Fabry Perot modes, how they're spaced by C over 2L. They also walk a little bit like that as you spread them out or bring them in, right? And so what they do is they, they look at the buildup rate for the pulses that come out. When they build up the fastest, that's when the modes are matched. The longitudinal mode is matched to the master oscillator. And so it's, it's always looking at the build up time and, make, and shortening it. So what happens then is that you got this slave going through the cavity and it just, it just takes out all the gain. It just starves all the other modes of gain. So you get a slightly shorter pulse because of that. None of the other modes have a chance to compete and so what you're really doing is you're amplifying the mode that was inserted into the cavity, except now it's a, it's a giant pulse mode instead of uh, this tiny little wimpy little master oscillator. So I just told you how that works, the feedback control. Okay, the output light is at 1.064 micron for YAG. Okay, to get to other wavelengths you can use nonlinear optics. The, the point here is that you have so much energy at the peak of the pulse that you can do lots of nonlinear things you can't do with CW lasers with the same average power, which is why we use pulse lasers. So you can use second harmonic generation to produce 532 nanometer light. It's a Chi-2 process, okay? We talked about that, those processes in lecture three. You have a crystalline and an ingestible box and you can tweak the phase matching angle. I mentioned phase matching before. You have to, it's a, it's a photon momentum problem. They have to come together at the right angle to produce this other photon. The conversion efficiency is below 50%, but you know, you're going to 532 nanometers, which is, that's a photon with twice as much energy. So nowadays you can get well over a, a joule per pulse at 532 nanometers, which is, that's a scary number if you ask me. A joule is a lot of energy. 10 hertz, 10 to 30 hertz for, for, this, for a flash lamp pumped yag, which is what I'm still talking about. Hmm. You can do third harmonic. Uh, uh, you mix 106 with 532. That's what's called a parametric process. That's usually just built in as well. And then 266, you just frequency double the 532 to get that. So you can get those different wavelengths from the yag laser. And here's what's, here's what's inside one of those things. There's the high reflector, there's the Q-switch, two pump chambers, output coupler. So that's the oscillator. I don't know if this one's got a... The, the thing is the, uh, the injection seeder is so small you can't tell where it is in a picture like this. I don't even know if it's got one. There are two single pass amplifiers to build up more gain, and then that box has got the crystals in it for switching wavelengths. And this design actually is almost identical to the design that was in the laser that produced that first PLIF picture in 1982. It's, it's a really robust design. Okay, diode pumped YAG lasers. 
so here's, a, here's part of the absorption profile for the neodymium in the YAG, okay, and it's broader than that, but like I said, the lamps, the lamp spectrum is much, much broader, and it's just pounding on this, okay? And, and uh, it's, it, it looks, the lamp spectrum looks flat compared to this absorption spectrum. Well, gallium arsenide diode lasers, they're lasers. They're very narrow bandwidth, and they emit right there, right, at, right where there's an absorption line for YAG. And so it's extremely efficient the way you can pump energy into this same transition. You can tune the diode laser wavelength by controlling its temperature, and they sit on thermoelectric coolers, and you just adjust the, uh, the temperature until you maximize the laser output. Uh, so I, they, I worked on these lasers uh, when I was at Spectrophysics, and, and if you, if you uh, um, end pump them, you can mode match the, uh, the pumping beam straight into the TEM00 mode, so there's actually no gain outside of the TEM00 mode, you're just end pumping into the ag rod. So you get incredibly efficient lasers, which don't require all that cooling and everything else, and then you get rid of all the turbulence-based noise that happens and so forth. Yeah, so no water cooling in the laser head. It's all solid state. It, very high stability, low amplitude noise, and very st unbelievably stable beam pointing. In fact, we had to completely re rebuild the beam pointing measurement system because this laser was so stable that it looked like there was no variation in the beam pointing, which that can't be true. Unfortunately, the diodes can be expensive, and in the past they were incredibly unreliable. But now they're better. So this is the laser I designed when I was at Spectrophysics. It uh, was about that big. It was fiber coupled. In those days, you could only get gallium arsenide diode lasers that had 50 milliwatts of power, which is just ridiculous when you consider how much power they have nowadays. And so, and they weren't reliable, so you were gonna have to change them out all the time. So the idea was you put the diode lasers inside the power supply and they come through the fiber optic to pump the gain medium. So the gain medium, you didn't, when the diodes died, you didn't have to pull the laser out of an instrument. You could just go, go back to the power supply and change the diodes in there. That was the idea. So this one was a Q-switch laser. It had a, uh, an acousto-optic uh, Q-switch inside, and this is a frequency doubler on the front of it. Um, that laser was actually used for this thing called link blowing, which I don't think they have a need for anymore. I don't really know, but in, in the old days, they used to make uh, memory chips with just a whole lot of stuff on it. I mean, they made a whole lot of memory chip. And then they would like test the chip, and they would find these places that weren't working properly, and then they would blow the link to them. So when you bought a memory chip, there were all kinds of places that were just dead, but that was how they made chips in those days. And so they needed this laser for link blowing. So that's what it was designed for. This is what's in a... Uh, um, Laser pointer, like the, the one you, you loaned me, the green one. There's a gallium arsenide diode laser right there. There's this, uh, this focusing lens. It's amazing how things have changed nowadays. This is, these kind of lenses can now uh, be manufactured fairly simply. They're, they're made of a, of a somewhat softer glass. They're polished a little bit, but then they're heated and pressed. Okay, and then here's the, this is neodymium vanadate little chip of neodymium vanadate. And then right on top of it is, is a crystallite. So th this is like, it looks almost like a little Fabry Perot, right? It's just a chip that's coated. That's the laser. And then KTP is the frequency doubling crystal. Then you up collimate with these two lenses. Now, notice how this has got an infrared filter on it. There, there are some, uh, you see these laser pointers that are for sale sometimes from the People's Republic that have this amazing amount of output power. A friend and I who used to work for Spectrophysics started emailing back and forth and it, there is, okay, if, if you look at the, the power demand, you know, what laser are they using and that kind of thing, um, they aren't blocking the infrared. And that's why when you put it in a power meter, it looks like it has a huge amount of power, right? <laughs> but it doesn't have more green. It just, it has inf but the trouble is it has infrared hidden in the green beam, and that's actually dangerous. So you want to buy one that has an infrared blocking filter. Nowadays, this is a, C, a, a CW diode pump laser from Edgewave. This is just unbelievable. It's all because the diodes have changed a lot. Uh, you can get 60 microjoules per pulse at 106, four nanosecond pulse widths with massive repetition rate. That's just, the whole world has changed. But the basic structure is about the same as what we worked on a long time ago when the diodes were so wimpy. Mm 
Die lasers, uh, the trouble with solid state lasers is they run at fixed wavelengths and if you want to be able to tune and do spectroscopy you have to be able to figure out how to hit other wavelengths like these here or like, uh, like the ones this will hit. So you, some of you have been talking about this. Uh, Syrah makes a dye laser that a lot of people like to use. It's actually based on the old uh, Lambda Physique dye laser from the days when Lambda Physique was making uh, excimer lasers, but they split off and this has been a, an improvement on the old Lambda Physique laser. So you can run these at various uh, repetition rates depending on the pump laser. They make them for different repetition rates. But the, the nice thing about dyes is you can choose from a lot of different dyes. You mix them in solution with methanol. And so this is like a dye tuning curve. This is DCM, which is a very common red dye. So you put that in your dye laser, and then you can tune across that gain bandwidth, right? So the dye laser actually is much more narrow bandwidth. So it gives you lots of tuning range. Or if you run to the edge of that, you can switch over to a different dye or switch to a different dye. There's, there's just a whole lot of uh, possibilities with dye lasers. How many of you have used dye lasers? Oh, I would have expected more than that. Here's the layout for, for uh, the Syrah dye laser, which looks like a Lambda Physique. So you're going to pump this laser with uh, green light from a uh, pulsed YAG, say. So here comes the green light. You split some of that light off to this. This is the oscillator for the dye laser. And we're looking down on it, OK? So this is a cell which has uh, clear sides to it. The sides are clear. And, and you, you uh, flow dye through it. There's a dye pump that, that flows the dye through, and that's because you get the dye too hot if you just leave it sitting in the cell. It'll start boiling if you just keep nailing it with all that energy, right? So you keep it flowing, and you keep it cooled. Um, and so the, what you do is you, uh, you pump it with uh, this, this uh, green laser, but you spread the beam into a horizontal sheet as it goes through because there's going to be this beam that passes all the way along there. You want to mode, you want a mode match, it's called, the, the gain medium with the intracavity uh, uh, beam. And so you try to make the gain profile fit inside the intracavity beam, which is why they're doing it that way. Now there's a grating right here, a beam expander for the intracavity beam and a grating, and it goes out and hits this mirror. So what you're going to do is, basically you're going to tune the grating to select a wavelength that you want, okay? And, and by spreading it out like this and hitting a mirror and, and coming back this way, you get, you get really good spectral resolution. Um, usually there's more, well, the beam expander is where all the magic is, and they're just showing it as a block. But you can get the fairly narrow bandwidths by doing that, and it's tunable as well. So then you go through uh, the output coupler, and then you go through a telescope. That's going to set the beam size in the next amp. So you blow it up a little bit. You come down here. Now more... Uh, more light is going to hit this amp. This is what you have to uh, you have to make sure that the pump light arrives at the same time as the dye laser light. So you have to make you have to. That's why this has got a delay line in it. And then so then you you amplify it in this next cell. This is an oscillator. This is a high a high reflector and an output coupler. This is just a single pass amp. Then you go into doubling crystals, and then this is a compensator for the way you've just tweaked the beam. And then these prisms are used uh, as a way to separate the dye wavelengths from the second harmonic or whatever the doubling, whatever the crystal is going to give you. People tend to use prisms for very broad band systems because uh, you might be used to using dichroic mirrors that'll pass one wavelength and reflect the other. Well, that's only for a very narrow bandwidth. The, the Pellenbroca prisms will, will separate all different colors of light, so you just have to change their angles and things, and you can separate lots of colors that way. So this is a very flexible system that will give you lots and lots and lots of wavelengths. You can generate harmonics coming out, and there I just showed you a doubling crystal. So here's an example of a really difficult region to hit. Uh, this is the region around 226 you need to hit for NOLIF. You really should have about 10 millijoules per pulse at that wavelength, so uh, you're going to uh, have a little trouble here because this <laughs> didn't make it. But that's, uh, that's probably the most challenging uh, line to hit if, if, if you're using a dye laser. But modern dye lasers can, can get you up above 10. So let's talk about these short pulse lasers. Maybe you're not so familiar with those. Uh, you can make very short pulse. Well, actually, you can get well below 40 femtoseconds nowadays. You need a broadband gain medium. And here's titanium sapphire. Uh, 
when you think about it, this is, this is titanium and sapphire where the ruby lasers were chromium and sapphire, but the titanium has a four level system and it's extremely broad band. You're gonna, <laughs> I don't remember. There's actually, actually, the, here it is. Here's the uh, fluorescence of uh, Thai sapphire. So it's, it goes from about 650 up to uh, around 900. Ah, I put that there just to save myself. <laughs> and you're, we're going to use all of it if we can get away with it. We're going to use all of that. So mode locking, how does mode locking work? Well, we were just talking about mixing, so let's think in terms of RF electronics again. So we got some sort of intermediate frequency signal coming in, and we want to mix it with a local oscillator, right? So what happens? Well, if I do that, how does a mixer work? It multiplies, okay? And you can, you can mix in a lot of different ways. So uh, one way to think about it is the local oscillator might be, okay, the, the really crude way to imagine what's happening here is that maybe the local oscillator is what's driving the gain in an amplifier. So the, the amplifier gain is oscillating back and forth, driven by the local oscillator. And now we're going to amplify the intermediate frequency signal. So we're multiplying the signal from the local oscillator with the intermediate frequency signal. Right? So it's a multiplication process. You can do it with gain or you can do it with loss, either way. So you basically, if we, if we say this is a cosine signal, which, uh, okay, just crudely we can say that, that was, that's the uh, intermediate frequency signal, here's the local oscillator signal, you'll get some indifference frequencies just from trigonometry, right? So if we look over here, what's happening is those sum and fre difference frequencies are landing on the local oscillator signal. So by mixing, you end up getting these sidebands on the local oscillator. That's actually what happens inside a, 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 I'm running to the end of the day and my brain is fried. That's what happens in a locking amplifier also. But for this case, let's just talk about mode locking. For mode locking, the local oscillator is running specifically at the C over 2L mode spacing of the laser cavity. And so in the laser that I use, they actually sense the C over 2L mode spacing by looking at mode beats on a, on a photodiode and they synthesize the local oscillator signal that way so they know exactly what the uh, C over 2L mode spacing is at any particular moment in time. So the, the mode locker in, in my laser is an acousto-optic device so it's actually modulating intracavity loss but at the C over 2L mode spacing so if you think about it we're gonna put, here's, let's just pick this mode here we're going to put sidebands on this mode by that mixing process, but we're going to engineer this so that the sidebands land exactly in the next nearest neighbor longitudinal mode. And that's the point of mode locking. Each mode is going to mix with its neighbors, and so they're injection seeding themselves all the way across the gain bandwidth of the medium. They all injection seed each other. They lock in phase. That's the trouble with the noise in a laser, is a little bit of phase shifting. These things are incredibly quiet lasers because all the modes are locked together in phase all the time. And when you do that, if you think about it, a CW laser, there's, there's, you know, there's just a huge number of sine waves all coming out. You know, each, each longitudinal mode is a sine wave. There's a huge number of these coming out together in a CW laser. And if they're not organized this way, they're all just going to add up randomly, and that's why you get all this amplitude noise, right? It looks like a continuous wave beam, but it's really like a whole bunch of this stuff happening. In this, in this case, that's not happening th that way. These are all locked in phase with each other. So that produces an extremely quiet and stable laser. And if you think about it, so here's the gain bandwidth of Thai Sapphire, okay? with lots and lots and lots of longitudinal modes and now they're not moving in phase relative to each other, okay? So in terms of a Fourier sine series, they're all going to add up to each other, right? They make extremely short spikes in time. And you think in terms of the of Fourier transform, an infinite series of spikes in frequency makes an infinite, uh, an infinite series of spikes in time. And so that's how you get short pulses, simply by organizing the longitudinal modes. And now the more modes you add, you can think in terms of Fourier series, the more modes you add, the better fidelity you're going to get in terms of reproducing the spike in time. Mm 
And so this is actually synthesized in uh, uh, Mathematica. So think of each pulse as a summation of Fourier series, and we get what we call a transform limited pulse when all of those colors, now we talk in terms of the colors that all pile, this thing has such broad bandwidth we talk about colors piling on top of each other, okay? To make a pulse waveform, and that's called a transform limited pulse. That's the shortest pulse you can get if you succeed in piling all the colors on top of each other. Those pulses are so short, you can't just measure them with a photo detector. We use an autocorrelator that sweeps the two across each other slowly to figure out how short is the pulse. So there's an autocorrelation signal. So a mode lock laser is basically a normal stable cavity CW laser with a broad gain bandwidth and a loss modulator in the cavity. That's it. So there's the laser I use. Uh, the average power is about four watts at 800 nanometers. Pulse rate of 82 megahertz, which turns out to be exactly the same as the C over 2L mode spacing of the laser. I mean, think about that in terms of the Fourier series, and it makes sense, right? The pulse width can be below 30 femtoseconds, up to 180, depending on what you do in the cavity. Really what that's about is forcing broad bandwidth and making sure that they all stay transform limited. So that's about 50 nanojoules per pulse, which is not much energy per pulse, but it's uh, still 500 kilowatts of power at the peak of the pulse. Hmm. This is a really nice laser. Some lasers are really frustrating, but this one's nice. Okay, how do you get more energy per pulse? Well, you have to use what's called chirped pulse regenerative amplification. This is an idea that was actually invented in radar back in World War II. So this is how we do things like short pulse cars, okay? We can, we can convert the four watts of average power into much more pulse energy if we slow down the pulse rate. We're gonna use the same kind of pump power. So a kilohertz system can generate four millijoules per pulse, which is a lot. That's around a terawatt at the peak of the pulse. But that much power would drill holes in the titanium sapphire, right? So we have to do this thing called chirp pulse regenerative amplification. So how do we do that? Well, I don't have a picture of what the amp looks like, but you spread the pulse out in time by separating the colors. We go into a pulse spreader, it's called, a pulse stretcher, and, and because there's so many colors in the thing, you send, you send the red out first and, and, the, and the blue trails much, much later. So now the, the peak of the pulse has come way down, okay? So the first thing you do is go through a pulse stretcher. Then there's a pockle cell, which is like the Q switch, right? And you fire that pockle cell to let a particular pulse enter a laser cavity, and that's a regenerative amplifier cavity, which has just been pumped by a pulse jag laser, a, a, a diode pump pulse jag. Now this long pulse bangs around inside that cavity uh, for maybe 10 to 20 passes till it gets up to the gain you want, and then use another pockle cell to switch it out. Now it's, now it's gained a whole lot of energy all across all the colors, and then you go into a pulse compressor that reverses what the stretcher did and piles all the colors on top of each other again and sends out this really intense pulse. I just said all that. Okay, any questions about femto lasers? Or? These things are really robust nowadays because it turns out two communities really wanted them. One was the uh, biomedical community, the people who do biomedical research. I don't know if you've heard about this depressing bit of news, but there's way more money in biomedical research than there is in our community. And, but those people aren't the kind who lift the hood and fix the laser. They wanted this thing to be push button and that's it. And they have a lot more money. And then the other thing is, is that these lasers turn out to be very, very good for drilling. In fact, a lot of uh, um, uh, diesel engine injector holes are drilled with these lasers. Because if you try to use a laser with a longer pulse, it'll heat the metal and that'll cause melts, and that causes a problem with the material. <clears throat> These don't melt anything because it's so short and no heating happens, it just blasts the stuff away. So the industrial types also didn't want to have to lift the hood and fix this thing either, so these things have been made robust now, they've been re-engineered, and you know, the, the old lasers, they really were terrible, they really were awful, but, uh, and they have a bad reputation because of that, but the newer ones are, are much, much better. Anyway, distributed feedback. You don't really need to have a Fabry Perot cavity. Here's a, here's a diode laser with a high reflector on the back, here's a diode chip, and then there's this thing that's like a grating. There is no mirror over here. This grating is gonna reinforce, it's gonna provide the feedback that's gonna reinforce the, the structure of the laser, the longitudinal mode structure of the laser. Uh, 
So we don't use an output coupler. It's called distributed feedback. In fact, you can also make distributed feedback die lasers. You remember when I showed you a couple of laser beams intersecting and they make that fringing pattern? The way a distributed feedback die laser works is two green beams come in and they hit a, they hit a die cell. That produces a grating in the die that is the distributed feedback for the die laser. And then they tune that laser by just changing the angle of the pump beams and that changes the grating structure. Those are, nice, those are nice dye lasers. You don't buy those from Syrah, those. The only people I know who've made those made their own. Let's talk about quantum cascade diode lasers. Those are very promising diode lasers. Uh, and I mentioned distributed feedback because they are distributed feedback lasers. So here's a, here's a picture of uh, a, a, Q, a QC diode laser chip. And you can see the DFB structure built into the top of it. So there's no output coupler for this thing. The QC diode lasers don't have a four-level system. They operate a little bit differently. Did, uh, some of you have taken quantum mechanics, right? Did you, ever, did you start out with the particle in a box problem? Yeah, that's, that's this sort of characteristic, canonical, uh, confined wave structure thing. Well, that's what this is. It's just a whole bunch of particles in a box. So there are the boxes, right? And, but there's a lot of them, okay? And, there, and there's current that flows through this thing, okay? So there's electron confinement inside a quantum well. That's the, that's the box that it sits inside. And then it hops back out and goes back down and gives off light. Every time it's confined and then moves on, it gives off light. And so one electron can give off a number of photons as it passes down through this cascading system. And, and so the wavelength of the light that's given off is, is controlled by the structure of these quantum wells. And that's, I don't know if you ever heard about the history of QC diode lasers. They became very, people were really excited by them in the, in the, uh, the 1990s. And I actually, I bought several of them. You, <laughs> it was so funny, this guy at this company, I, I called him up and wanted one at 4.6 microns for CO. That's the fundamental band for CO, vibrational band. And he said, no, but I can sell you 5.1. And I go, no, I don't want 5.1. And he said, why do people always want to choose their own wavelength? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like because this is spectroscopy. <laughs> so, uh, and, and you could not get lasers. It was, a, it was just terrible. But now it's much, much better. They're, now they're reliably shipping what they said they were going to send you. <laughs> Anyway, the structure induces these electronic transitions to the next lower level, and then on and on and on, giving off light. So these things are very high power. Uh, they have very wide wavelength coverage from 3.7 up to 16 microns, and this is for different uh, materials and structures, okay? And just like the dye lasers, you can tune them. So that's not the output wavelength of the laser, that's the tuning range of the laser, okay? So you can tune them the same way we normally tune diode lasers, just by changing the, the temperature of the chip, and it will scan. And that's it for lasers. Anybody got questions about uh, lasers? Um, well, you should certainly look at it. Uh, so the question was, uh, if I have an old dye laser, are there components that age? If somebody did not clean out the dye cells, you may never be able to get those clean again. And if you try to hit them with uh, heavy green pump power, you'll just destroy everything. So check the cells and see if they were cleaned out. The grating might be, see, lots of things can destroy a high quality grating, like, like if there's, uh, if you've had hydrocarbon vapors in the air or anything like that, the grating might be gone. Um, but the other, the other optics, if you just look at them and they haven't been drilled or anything like that, they should be fine. So I would just check the grating in the dye cells. And then you have to figure out how to align it. But you can probably find manuals on the web. What kind of laser is it? Uh, well, I bet you, be, uh, you might even be able to find some replacement parts from Syrah because they're, they're imitating a lot of the same structures. So, uh, 
Yeah. Well, that was a nice dye laser. Other questions? You can sweep them fairly fast, so yeah, people, people, people can do uh, wavelength modulation spectroscopy with those, things like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, you can, you can sweep uh, uh, Thor Labs, I've never, <laughs> Thor Labs is selling QC diodes, and I, 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 tried to buy, I tried to buy these things at the wrong time. Anyway, uh, he said that Thor Labs can, can be swept up to, what'd you say, 10 megahertz? Wow, that's amazing. Uh, if, if you want to do uh, diode laser stuff, you really should check into QC diode lasers now because they finally have reached the point where you can buy them and they won't complain that you wanted your own wavelengths and they, it, won't be, it won't just be broken and so. Other questions? All right, well, I'll see you at the dinner tonight, I guess. <laughs>